going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yes, I know we're in uh, the Beatitudes, but uh, just trust me on this. And uh, if you don't have your Bibles with you or you don't have a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,148. 1,148. You'll be able to find 2 Corinthians 5. You'll be able to turn there and follow along with us in our passage that we're looking at this evening. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you. We want you to have a Bible and read the Bible because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Um, hey, how many of you like paying taxes? I mean, you know, there's some good stuff that comes from paying taxes, but one of the frustrating things is a lot of times we pay taxes, we're frustrated because we know there's a lot of waste involved in that. And, uh, and, and if you live in Arizona and you pay taxes, Arizona state income taxes, then uh, we're blessed to live in a state where they actually give us the freedom to direct some of our tax revenue. And if you don't know about this, then uh, listen up, because this is really cool. This is not the sermon, by the way. This is, just, uh, this is just something that's really cool that we get to do because you can direct some of your uh, in income tax that you pay to the state to charities like, well, I mean, the public school is not a charity, but you can direct it to the public school uh, to help with extracurricular activities, sport, sporting activities. You can direct it to Christian schools like Calvary Christian Academy through ACSTO. And uh, God's actually calling to say it's a good idea. And... Uh, <laughs> And so you can, uh, but you, you know, you can direct money to students at Calvary Christian Academy. If you don't know any students at Calvary Christian Academy, you can just direct it to Calvary Christian Academy and they'll give it to, to help students pay for their tuition. And uh, like you can give to qualifying nonprofits like Faith and Grace. And uh, if you don't know what Faith and Grace is, it's our local domestic violence shelter that we uh, partner with. And, and so uh, you can actually direct some of your tax dollars to bless them. And, and so if you pay Arizona state income taxes, can I just encourage you to avail yourself of the options that are there to bless, you know, in Jesus' name or, or just bless students because you can uh, through the available options. And there'll be some people by the doors uh, handing these out if you want them. You don't have to take them. We're not trying to you know, sell you on it. There's also some of these available at the connection centers. You can just go by and pick them up. But, uh, and you don't need these, but mention it to your tax preparers. They'll help you uh, uh, bless, in the name of Jesus, uh, some really great ministries that are out there. So, uh, we're in the Beatitudes. You guys know that, right? I know, I just asked you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, page 1148, in case you're, you missed that part. And, uh, but I figured by now, you already kind of know the Beatitudes by heart. If you're new, you're excused, Okay. If you haven't been here all this time, but if you've been here for the whole series so far, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Don't worry about it. You, sh you, know, you should be pretty familiar with the Beatitudes because Jesus in Matthew 5 said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's where we're at tonight. So uh, I ask you to turn in your Bibles. So we want the good life, right? Okay, you know we're still in the series, The Good Life. We're looking at the Beatitudes. We're learning to apply them so we can get to the good life. Because you got to find uh, the good life through Jesus and through his teachings. But there's one thing that repeatedly gets in the way of us really enjoying the good life, and that's conflict. Conflict. Does anybody here like conflict? Now, if you raised your hand, we, we got counseling available. Uh, <laughs> we'd love to, to help you out. So how many of you are frustrated or you just avoid conflict? Yeah, see, there's some of the hands. Some of you are like, uh, if I raise my hand, that's going to be conflict. I'm not going to do that. See, the reality is we live in a sin-filled world. So conflict is a reality for our lives. You can't really escape it. You can't get away from it. And yet Jesus tells us that we can be blessed and live the good life if we embrace the concept of being peacemakers. 
Because he said, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called sons of God. So uh, as we talk about the good life, as we talk about being a peacemaker, I want you to understand that God initiated the peace process. God initiated the peace process. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, this is one of my favorite short passages in Scripture. Beginning at verse 17, it, you, you might understand why as we read this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Does that sound familiar? Like it's on the shirts of every person we baptize here at Calvary? New creation. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, God initiated the peace process. Peacemaking is not only God's idea, it's God's very heart. We see it in the biblical story, the way that it unfolds. Because uh, the story of, of the world is that God created the heavens and the earth, right? And then uh, we rebelled. We rebelled. I mean, God put us in paradise. I know, not me and you, but our ancestors, right? The first people. God put them there in paradise. Said, hey, you can do whatever you want. There's one rule. One rule. Not ten. Not 630, just one rule. Could they keep the one rule? No, no they couldn't. They decided that they were going to take over the place and run it the way they saw fit. Uh, they were going to run it their way instead of God's way. And so if we don't like the world, the way it works, the condition that it's in, it's our fault because we did this to God's paradise. I know, it's not your fault. You wanna, don't want to take the blame for that. But our ancestors started the rebellion and we all joined in. Right? We all joined in. We also have rebelled against God. We decided that we could do it better than God. We could do it our way, not his way. And so we, that's exactly what we did. We lived on our terms. And so uh, we brought destruction and death into this world. That's, by the way, that's why death touches all of us. And because of this rebellion, we all deserved hell. Because the wages of sin is death. So we rebelled. And God reconciled. We started the war, and God started the peace. Did, did you catch this in the text? He says in verse 18, all this is from God. This whole new creation stuff, it's from God. The whole forgiveness stuff, it's from God. He's the one who sent Jesus to reconcile us to himself. It's from God. And then in verse 19, he says, hey, not counting their sins against them, not counting their trespasses against them. And then in verse 21, this is one of those amazing verses. Just listen to this. For our sake, for your sake and my sake, God made Jesus to be sin, and Jesus knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Is that incredible? I mean, that's what God did. Jesus became sin so that you and I could live, so that we could be forgiven. So God reconciled, not because we begged him to, not because we asked him to, not because we negotiated for peace. We were still sinners. We were still rebels when God sent Jesus into this world. God reconciled because he loves us. God reconciled because he loves you. This is personal. So I have to ask the question, have you been reconciled to God? Have you come to that place in your life where you acknowledge, hey, I, I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I need God. And you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world. You believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. You believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. If you've done that, 
then have you also, uh, are, are you, do you know, as you sit here, do you know that, I mean, and I ask this because I want you to be certain, do you know your sins are forgiven? Do you know that heaven is your destination? Do you know that, uh, oh, have you declared that publicly in baptism? Yes. See, and if you haven't, then see us because we can help you be obedient uh, to Jesus. We can fix that. Now, if you answered yes to all those, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but if you didn't answer yes to those questions, then why not? I mean, we rebelled. All of us have rebelled, not just you, all of us. And God wants to reconcile us to himself. That's why he sacrificed Jesus on the cross for you and for me. And, and if you will place your faith and trust in Jesus, he will forgive all your sins and he will also guarantee heaven is your destiny. And, and if you want to do that, you can do it right now where you're sitting or where you're joining us online and you can just say, God, I surrender. I give I, I myself to you. I need you. Please save me. The scripture says if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Now, if you pray that and, and you can want to confess that right now, you can do it where you're, where you're seated. But see us afterwards if you're in the room. You know, let the prayer team know that's here at the front. Uh, fill out a Connect card. Find one of the pastors and tell us because we want to follow up with you. If you're, doing, if you're joining us online and, and tonight, today is when you confess Jesus, let us know. Email us. Please let the service host know. We want to celebrate. Now, a lot of you said yes. So if you said yes to those questions, if you know that you've been reconciled to God, then you are a follower of Jesus, and that means that we are responsible to promote peace. We are responsible to promote peace. God gave us this task. He gave us this mission. He gave you and I this responsibility. Did, did you catch that in verses 18 and 19? All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Uh, we are responsible to promote peace. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation and entrusted the message of reconciliation to us. So we are responsible to promote peace. We're responsible to promote peace between God and people. Between God and people. I mean, this is all about people coming to faith in Jesus. And he pleads in verse 20, be reconciled to God. God desires people to know him and to love him. This is the good news. And here's the crazy part of the good news. God entrusted this message of hope to us. God entrusted the message of hope to me and you. Even though we're faithless, even though we're bubbles, even though we've failed him over and over and over again, God said, hey, you know what? I got this great plan. Not only am I going to pay for the sins of the world through Jesus, but I'm going to give these faithless people who are my servants the responsibility to share the message of good news with the world. I mean, isn't that kind of cool? That God trusted you and me with this? I mean, I'm, it's an incredible privilege, isn't it? I mean, God does not need us. We need him. We just sang that, right? God doesn't need us. I mean, do you think about how God could have, like, communicated the gospel to the people of the world? I mean, he could have had it so that you, when you walked outside at night and you looked up at the stars, that he just wrote John 3, 16 in the stars. And everybody sees it in their language. If you don't know what John 3, 16 is, look it up. Uh, so, I mean, it's just, it's the message. He doesn't need us, but he said, hey, I'm going to have our people do this. I'm going to have my family, my children do this. By the way, this is why Calvary is radically committed to the mission of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Okay, that's why we do what we do. So how are you promoting peace between people and God? How are you involved in the ministry of or the mission of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? So you heard about Serve Our Schools next Saturday. Are you signing up to, to go and represent Jesus in a way that is, is powerful to the community and makes a difference in the lives of people? We'd love for you to do that. Love for you to join us. I'm going to be at Thunderbolt. They say we have enough help. I never believe that. It's because I'm lazy. So, I, I mean, our, my life group's serving at Thunderbolt. We're going to be there painting. So, uh, you know, are you involved? It, it's, uh, and by the way, if you're like, well, I'm busy Saturday, we got some Friday projects too. <laughs> 
See, we will answer those questions for you. And then, and then who are you inviting? You, you, you know, we're, we're here we are, it's February, but Easter is not that far away. So, you know, start thinking about who are, you, who are you praying for and planning to invite to come to Easter? You know, there's people that won't come to church any other time, but they might come Easter. Your friends, your neighbors, your family. Who are you starting to target and say, okay, God, soften their heart, make them ready to say yes. You see, we're responsible to promote peace between God and people. But we're also responsible to promote peace between people and people. To live as peacemakers. Because blessed are the peacemakers. So we inhabit a world of conflict because of sin. Everybody sinned. And Jesus wants us to heal people and give them life through, through the gospel. Okay, that, that's our task. He wants us to communicate the message of reconciliation. And to do that, we need to know how to live at peace with people, to promote peace and to live as peacemakers. And, and if you start reading scripture, which we highly encourage around here, you'll start discovering that it's full of admonitions for us to be peaceful. The Apostle Paul says things like, hey, as far as it, it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God, for vengeance is mine, says Lord, I will repay. He just he goes on and on and on about being a peacemaker. So uh, I wonder if the church in America has declined and lost influence because we're better at fighting wars than promoting peace. And I'm not talking about being a pacifist or anything. I mean, think about it. Churches fight amongst themselves, and, and they divide and split over power plays and money and trivial issues and personalities. Has anyone else been part of a church fight? Anyone got the scars? Okay, we, we can, we, I mentioned we have counseling available. It's, uh, it's all good. See, here at Calvary, we are committed to only fighting for the mission of Jesus. Okay, that, that's it. And then churches fight with each other. I mean, denominations attack other denominations. Denominations split. And unfortunately, I've seen that up close and it's ugly. And Christians attack other Christians because we disagree. You know, you know, in the secular media, there's all kinds of bomb throwers that are always trying to start, you know, arguments and start fights and, and get everybody all angry about stuff so they can get ratings and get money. You know, the sad thing is, there's a lot of people in the Christian world that do the same thing. In the Christian media, in the Christian blogs, in the Christian online, that, that are attacking other Christians because they don't agree. They don't agree with how they do things, they don't agree with what they believe or what they say, so they attack. And then churches fight with the culture. I mean, we clash over important issues. Issues like valuing the lives of the unborn and the biblical definitions of family. Uh, values that we should hold on to unapologetically. But sadly, and this is, this is the part that is tragic, we fight just like the world does. We fight dirty. And we don't represent Jesus in that moment. And yet Jesus said the path to the good life is found in being a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called sons of God. So, do you still want the good life? Yes. <laughs> do you still want the good life? Yes. Okay, well, that's a little more enthusiastic. The first one might have been a little more honest, but, you know, hey, let's, let's go with the second one. If you want the good life, then let's talk about practices of peacemaking. Practices of peacemaking. I want to discuss three actions or three practices that will help promote peace. Now, there's a whole lot more than this, but I'm just going to boil it down to, to three actions that I'm going to share with you. But before I do, I want to give you a mental picture of a peacemaker versus a warmonger. Anybody else notice this bucket up here? You guys wondering what the bucket was for? I want to use it as an illustration. So, obviously, this is a bucket, but uh, here's, my, here's kind of my analogy, how I think about these things. Imagine, if you will, that every conflict is a fire. Every conflict that you have with any people, every conflict that you witness, it's a fire. And some of them are, are like a match. Uh, they're tiny. Uh, some of them are like a little small, you know, campfire, a candle. Some of them are like uh, a bonfire. Some of them are like an out-of-control forest fire, okay? Every conflict is, is like fire. Okay, and you've got conflicts in your life. They may be candle size and they may be bonfire size, but you've got conflicts in your life. And, uh, and every one of us 
is carrying around a bucket. Now, you can't see the bucket because the bucket is actually on the inside of you. Okay, you have this bucket, not this one, but this is mine. <laughs> but every one of us has a bucket, okay? And, and in the bucket determines whether you are a peacemaker or a warmonger. Because I think everyone either is carrying around a bucket full of water or a bucket full of gasoline. And you discover what it is by, in other people's buckets by watching what they do with conflict. Because if there's a f conflict that's happening and you see them put water on it, you go, oh, look, they're a peacemaker. If you see conflict happening and suddenly they escalate it and throw f uh, gasoline on it, you know they're not a peacemaker. People are like, well, I'm not going to throw anything. I'm just going to turn around and walk away. You're not a peacemaker. You're just avoiding the conflict. You still have something in your bucket. We just don't know what it is because you avoided demonstrating it. So if people could see what's in your bucket, would they see water or would they see gasoline? Do you make conflicts better or worse by your behavior? See, because that's what peacemaking is all about. I better put this behind the light. Otherwise, the band will get upset and I'm trying to make peace. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to be a peacemaker... Just understand that peacemakers evaluate actions, not motives. Peacemakers evaluate actions, not motives. One source of conflict is judging people's motives. Judging people's motives. And see, we're always wrong when we judge people's motives. You know why? You know why you're always wrong when you judge people's motives? Because you can't see their motives. Right? Who can see their motives? Yeah, somebody, one person got the answer right. God can see their motives. God sees our hearts. God knows our motives. And, and you can stare at somebody else as long as you want. You are unable to actually see their motives. And so if you go ahead and decide that what their motives are, you know what you're doing? You're judging. Yeah, did you guys know that Jesus taught about that in Matthew 7? Where he warned us to not judge or else we'd also be judged. For the measure you use is going to be measured to you. And then he went on to tell a little story about taking a log out of your own eye so you can help your brother take the speck out of his. In other words, he said, don't, don't be judging each other. And, and that's what we do when we evaluate people by their motives. When we decide, we know why they're doing what they're doing. Peacemakers evaluate by actions what people do. You know, uh, having grown up in church, I've witnessed Many times people excuse bad behavior. I mean, people do evil things. They do mean things. You know, publicly, they do these things. And I've heard people say, well, you know, he meant well. Didn't look like it. Well, he has a good heart. Can't tell by what he did. Well, he tithes. See, we excuse bad behavior. And we come up with these reasons. And, but at the same time, I've seen the same people condemn good behavior. Like, oh, I know why he did that. Right? Or he's just trying to impress people. Or how about, I wonder what she's up to. She's just being kind to that new family because she's got designs on their husband, son, whatever. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. Am I the only one who's been around these conversations where you go, hey, that's evil. You're condemning good behavior, but you're excusing bad behavior. See, peacemakers only evaluate actions, and that means that we ask questions instead of making accusations. Like, did you? As opposed to, why did you? It's not really a question when you ask, why did you? That's an accusation. Or we clarify with people instead of assuming, did you say this or you said? There's a difference. Or we call out bad behavior, accountability for everyone. We, we just don't excuse bad behavior, even if it's from a pastor. See, the rules apply to everyone. And we need to go ahead and say, hey, I'm going to judge people. I'll use that word. Evaluate it sounds so much better, doesn't it? But I'm going to judge people by what they do, not what I think the reason that they did it is for. 
Look, every one of us in this room at some point has been judged negatively for our motives, and it's not fun. So if you don't want people to judge your motives, guess what? Be a peacemaker. Stop judging theirs. So peacemakers evaluate actions, not motives. And peacemakers value relationships over being right. Peacemakers value relationships over being right. Look, we expend so much energy fighting about who is right. And a lot lot of times we break relationships over our opinions. I've seen too many parents grieving about broken relationships with their children, children grieving about broken relationships with their parents or their siblings. And, And a lot of times it's because, well, because we had different opinions and we expressed those and we wanted to win the argument more than we wanted to win the relationship. Now, I've said this before. In fact, I, I, I preached a, a few weeks ago. But uh, God is righteous, which means God is right. We just read about it in verse 21. And we are unrighteous, and therefore we are... See, you guys keep using the normal words, like wrong. I like unright so much better. <laughs> because we're unrighteous. And so it works for my illustration. But it, think of it however you want. God is right. We are wrong. We are unrighteous or unright. And God valued relationship with us more than he valued being right. How do we know this? Did you catch it? Verse 21. For our sake, God made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin. He was righteous so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We were unrighteous, and Jesus was righteous, and God said, hey, I'm going to take all of your stuff, all of our stuff, and, and put it on Jesus so that you can have his righteousness given to you. Not because you deserve it, but because it's a gift, because he loves you, and he loves me. So God valued relationship with us more than being right. If relationship is the priority, it will change the way we relate to every single person. Let me say that again. If if relationship is a priority, it'll change the way you relate to every person. So here at Calvary, here's how we live this out. We believe that relationship precedes rebuke. I think it'll work in your life too if you practice this. But relationship precedes rebuke. In other words, people need to know that you love them and you care for them before you tell them the truth. So we're going to love first. We're going to serve first. We're going to welcome first. Did I mention serve our schools? Car show in a couple weeks after that. See, all of those things are so we can prove to people, hey, we love you. We care about you. We want to to welcome you. And then we're going to still tell them the truth. But understand, the gospel is a rebuke to every single one of us. The gospel means that we acknowledge that we are sinners, that we are weak, that we need help, that we cannot do this ourselves, and that we need to change our lives based upon the word of God. The gospel means, when you you embrace it, it means that we're wrong and God is right, and so we accept that. Look, that's a rebuke to everybody who hears it, but especially to people who don't know Jesus. It's a harsh rebuke. So we're going to tell the truth in the context of relationship. We're going to tell it with as much love as we can because Jesus came full of grace and truth. They're not exclusive of one another. So please stop arguing about who is right or really technically less wrong in your relationships and decide that you're going to win the relationship rather than the argument. Decide that you're going to win the relationship rather than the argument. That's what peacemakers do. So peacemakers value relationships over being right, and peacemakers live as ambassadors of Jesus. Verse 20. These are sobering words. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Look, if you call yourself a Christian, you have taken on the role of being an ambassador for Jesus. And God decided that we would represent Jesus to the world. That is amazing. I mean, you might call it crazy, but it's amazing. That's what God decided to do. Now, here's how I want to sum that up. We're we're the ambassadors for Jesus. Jesus wasn't a jerk. We shouldn't be either. 
okay? If, 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 if you can't remember anything else, just remember that. Jesus wasn't a jerk, so you don't have permission to be one either. So um, do you drive like an ambassador of Jesus or a jerk? <laughs> Especially if you got that Calvary sticker on your car. <laughs> Does your social media reflect you as an ambassador of Jesus or an angry political hack? Do you tip like an ambassador of Jesus or like a cheapskate? Do you cheer for your child's sports teams as an ambassador of Jesus or a rude fanatic? Does your family believe you're an ambassador of Jesus or a hypocrite? See, the reason this is sobering to me is because as a follower of Jesus, everywhere you go, you represent Jesus. Everything you do, you are representing Jesus. Every word you speak represents Jesus. Or misrepresents Jesus. See, I wonder if that powerlessness that I talked about plaguing the church in America is because we're not very good peacemakers. Because we're not representing Jesus very truthfully. And so people have dismissed him because of us. You see, if we live as ambassadors for Jesus, if we live as peacemakers, now, you'll have less conflict in your life because you reap what you sow. But here's the cool thing. People will actually know that you belong to God. And you won't have to tell them. But if it comes up and you do mention, hey, I believe in Jesus, I follow Jesus, you know what they'll say if you're a peacemaker? They'll say, I know. Now, if you're not a peacemaker, they'll say, you are? <laughs> Which case, you need to go back to that whole misrepresenting Jesus thing that we just talked about. But if you live as a peacemaker, people will know you belong to God and you will be living the good life. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that even though we started the war, you started the peace. Thank you that you valued a relationship with us more than being right, because otherwise we'd only be destined for hell. But you have given us hope. You've given us grace. You've given us peace. You've given us life beyond this world and life abundant in this world. And God, we just confess that so often we are angry, divisive people and we want to be peacemakers. We want to live the good life. We want to follow Jesus. God, we want to represent Jesus better than we have been. So do whatever it takes to make us look like the sons of God that you want to call us. Help us to follow Jesus better so that this world will believe in you and know that you're real. Starting right here in Lake Havasu and Parker. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.